I am absolutely blown away and excited because for years I've listened to this man's voice and so have you. Larry Elder is the sage from South Central. He is a man that can speak into our culture uh, quite effectively, maybe perhaps more than most today. Larry Elder has gained the respect of so many people here in Southern California, and I would love to see Larry Elder uh, advance so much more. I, I, he's successful, he's been blessed, and he blesses us daily on the Salem Radio Network across this nation, and he's going to give us uh, a little bit of time and some wisdom. Larry, it's great to have you with us on this podcast. Thank you so much for having I'm me. So I appreciate grateful. it. I'll give you some time. Do I don't it. know about the wisdom part. We'll, oh, we'll, no, no. You we'll, will. We'll you, see. You never disappoint. <laughs> Larry, in, in the time that we have, imagine for a moment if, if the plane is going down, and it might be here in California. And as we've uh, heard so many times before, as California goes, so goes the nation. What would you like to see? If you could rub a Larry Elder a magic ball lamp, what would come out for this country, for this state? Wow. I would want people to reaffirm why this country is great. Mm -hmm. This country is great because of the fact that we as a people have decided that our values are bigger and stronger than can be given by man. Our values come from a higher power, they come from God. Now that may sound like boilerplate, uh, hackneyed mm -hmm. kind of uh, sloganism, but this was a country that was founded on the principle that people have inalienable, inalienable mm -hmm. rights that cannot be taken away fr from them by anybody, by any power. This is the first time there's ever been a government that was formed by the consent of the people. And the Constitution is a contract. It's not a living, breathing document the way the left says. That's right. It's a contract. And it binds the federal government to a handful of limited responsibilities and duties, leaving the rest of them to the states and to the people. And for us to get away from that would mean the end of this country as we know it. Mm. And just because things have continued to go well, irrespective of who's in charge, irrespective of the values of the person uh, who's in charge, doesn't mean that will always be the case. Right. At some point, things go too far. And I'm very worried that things might have gone too far. I'm very concerned about our culture. I'm concerned about Hollywood. I'm concerned about academia. I'm concerned about our media. All three of them in my opinion, do not appreciate the fact mm. that the America was founded upon the values I just now mentioned. This is a Judeo-Christian country, and we're getting increasingly away from that. And once you get away from that, just as President Trump said, once you have no, no longer have boundaries, you don't have a country, you don't have these values, you don't have an America. That's right. I, um, I completely share in what you just said, and you mentioned God. Without God, um, I guess there's no other place to move to in the world, but I would be absolutely hopeless. The only reason why I have, have hope is because I'm praying that God might, might do something profound. He's done profound things before. I pray that he does profound things again. Um, when you look around at, at the culture, you've responded actually to the culture with a very successful film. Can, can you talk about that? I can, and thank you for bringing that up. I think it's important for us on our side uh, to not uh, uh, leave the battlefield. And the battlefield mm -hmm. is culture. Yes. A lot of people are getting their values from late night television. Something like 10 to 12 percent of young people get their primary news source from, from these guys on, on late night right. TV. And they're all anti-Trump, uh, anti the very, the very values I just now mentioned. So we're, we're in a war uh, and a lot of young people are uh, getting their values from Hollywood and Hollywood is relentlessly left wing. Yeah. And so if we leave the battlefield, we don't make movies, we don't make entertainment, with our conservative messages in there, we're leaving it to the left wing. Yes. And so we need, to, we need to engage in that battlefield. And that's why I'm so pleased that my movie has resonated with so many young people. There's a website called IMDB uh, that uh, lists every movie that's ever been made, and they rate them from 1 to 10. Anybody that wants to uh, rate the movie can rate it. And the average movie gets a rating of around 6.5. Uncle Tom is getting a 9.4 rating, oh which is just out of the ballpark. Uh, for example, its opening box office weekend doubled the opening box office weekend of Bowling for Columbine, Michael Moore's documentary, yes. which went on to become the fifth highest grossing documentary in history. This doubled its opening weekend box office revenue. And I believe that Bowling for Columbine got a 7.4 rating, something like that. This movie is blowing people away. And when I read some of the written reviews, and there are about 500 of them, Every now and then I come across one who's a, a self-confessed liberal and he or she will say something like, one of my friends dared me to see the, your, your, your documentary, so I watched it. And I thought it was going to be a bunch of black conservatives sitting around telling people what to think. Instead, it was a, a bunch of black conservatives telling people about their story and telling people that they are free 
to think, and you're free to think as an American without mm -hmm. being maligned as an Uncle Tom or a sellout or things I can't say on, on a family show. Yeah, and so that's the, the impact it's had. And I, one other thing, a psychotherapist called my show. Uh, she said, I'm white. I have a woman I've been counseling for two years. She is shattered spiritually, mm -hmm. shattered physically. Her husband threw acid on her face. She's disfigured. And for two years, she has not smiled. She has not sat up. And as she's telling me this story, oh. um, she's crying. And she said, this may seem like a little thing to you, Larry, but wow. we decided to watch Uncle Tom together. And for the first time in two years, she sat up straight. She smiled. Larry, your movie is a pep talk to America in general oh. and a pep talk to black America in particular. And you're telling a story of, about America, that America has overcome its flaws towards a more perfect society. We have a positive story to tell. And as one of my characters in the uh, movie says, black America has come further ahead, from further behind, arguably than any other people in all of America, in, in all of the world. The world. And there is a historian uh, who's a liberal at Harvard. His name is uh, Orlando Patterson, and he's black. He's, uh, and he's been at Harvard since the 90s. And in the 90s, he said that America, despite its flaws, is the least racist majority white country uh, in the world, provides better opportunities for black people than any other country in, in anywhere else in the world, including all the countries of Africa. This is our story. And for crying out loud, this is a country that elected a black president and Twice. then re-elected him. Uh, and Obama got elected with 52% of the vote. When he walked into office the third week of January, his popularity was at 67%. Yeah. Now, how does that happen? How does it grow 15%, which means a whole bunch of people who didn't vote for him right. still pulled, pulled for him? That's and right. the reason is because they were happy that Obama made a statement. And the statement that Obama made, a lot of people thought, was that America has overcome. Now, somebody, irrespective of that person's race, can come to, and, and become the most powerful person in the world. That person can become president of the United States. And that was the statement that we thought was made when Obama got elected. And that's why his approval rating went from 52% to 67% without him doing anything. Mm. What happened? Obama, fast forward, the Cambridge police acted stupidly. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharpton gets invited to the White House over 70 yeah. times. <laughs> I, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon, whatever the hell that means. Right. Meant. And in his speech before, Ferg before the United Nations, he said, we have our own problems. There's this place called Ferguson. Never mind, Michael Brown uh, didn't, have, didn't have his hands up, didn't say don't shoot. His right. whole friend lied about this. Right. So rather than do what people thought Obama was going to do, Obama did the opposite. Because the political Obama mm -hmm. knows that in order to get that 95% black vote, you got to get black people angry. You have to get them convinced that racism remains a major problem in Is America. Is that true? That's what he thinks. Okay, I was going to say, and, please but, make but, that but, not but, be true. But, but the man himself, think about it, Pastor. This is a guy with a name, Hussein, middle right. name, from Hawaii. Right. First name, uh, Barack. Barack. Last name, Obama. Nobody could pronounce it. Right. He takes down Hillary. Yeah. And when I read about him deciding to run for president, he c convened a meeting with all of his homies, Valerie Jarrett, David That's Clough, right. Axelrod, all of them. And the article in Time magazine that described this meeting said, race never came up. That's because he didn't think of himself that way. Like all people that run for president, he has a massive ego. He thinks of, thinks of himself as a world beater because he is. Yeah. But he knows in order to get that black vote, in order to get the typical black guy to pull the lever for somebody like me, I've got to convince that black guy he's a victim. It's because not. think about it. You remove the racial part of it. Why would I vote for a, for a Democrat? I live in the inner city. I live near a school called Crenshaw High School where I went to high school. Right now, 3% of kids at my former high school can do math at grade level. 3% mm. of kids. And the school, the Crip School, the reason I know that is because Ice-T, 10 years after I went there, chose Crenshaw because he wanted to go to a Crip School. Now, you're living within a geographical radius of that school. You are mandated to send your kid to that school who just graduated from middle school, whether you want to or not. And the Republican Party is giving me an option. The Dem Democratic Party is right. not. Right. Why in the world would I pull the lever for that party? Second, immigration. Probably the... Economist has done more work on the impact of legal and illegal immigration than anybody else is an economist named George Borjas from Harvard. And he says there are winners and losers because of illegal immigration, obviously. The sure, winners are illegals themselves. Uh, the winners are also people that employ them, pay them less money than they would otherwise pay for somebody else. The big losers, he says, are unskilled black and brown workers living mm. in the inner city who yeah. have to compete for jobs that would otherwise be held by them and who have downward pressure on their wages. 
So for those two reasons alone, if it weren't for my assumption that the man is out to get me and that I am oppressed by, by racist cops, why would I pull the lever for you guys? Right. So therefore, they have to pull this con, and it's a con. The con is racism remains a major problem in America when, in fact, it has never been more insignificant a factor. Both think tanks on the left and the right have said this. In order to succeed, uh, in order to escape poverty, you must do three things. Finish high school, says yes. Brookings Institution, which is okay. left wing, says AIE, American Enterprise Institution, which is right wing. Second, don't have a child until you get married. Right. Both say that. Third, get a job, keep a job, don't quit it right. until you get another job. You will not be poor. Say the left and the right. So so what are we talking about here? They don't say, unless you're black, unless you're Asian, unless you're gay, right. unless you're Hispanic. Both sides say, follow that formula, it you works. will not be poor. Why aren't Democrats telling people that? Because they don't want to. They want black people to think of themselves as victims, and they want liberal whites who sympathize with that also to pull the lever for them as well. So they're doing it for liberal whites and also for black people. It's a con, and they know full well it's a con. Oh, Obama gives a speech man. at Howard University, Pastor. And he says, if you could be born anywhere at any time, where would it be? It would be right here and today. Same guy who then says, racism is in America's DNA. What was that guy a little <laughs> right. while ago at, at, at Howard? Right. It's a con. Yeah. He says one thing to young people because he wants to inspire them, another thing to voters because he wants their vote. Yeah. It's a con. And I really do resent it because it's causing us not to have intelligent discussions yes. about the number one problem facing uh, America in general and facing black America in particular, and that is the fact that 70% of black kids yeah. are raised without Glad fathers. Forget about elder. Obama once said, a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to That's be poor true. and commit crime, yeah. nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. It is far and away the number one problem facing this country. And in 1965, 25% of black kids were born outside of wedlock. Now it's 70%. You cannot attribute that to slavery and to Jim Crow. That all happened because of the welfare state. What we've done, in my opinion, is we've incentivized women to marry the government. We've allowed true. men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Exactly. Real quick, we have to wrap this up. The, the film, Uncle Tom, is it historic or is it prophetic? It's both. Wow. It's both. What do you hope it achieves? I hope that it lets America know that we have a proud story to tell. And I'm hoping that white people will feel a little less guilty. Uh, when we come up with a vaccine for coronavirus, I hope we come up with a vaccine for white guilt because I think it is almost as poisonous a power in this country. A lot of white people feeling so guilty that they enact stupid policies, one of which is affirmative action, race-based preferences, uh, allowing black and brown kids admitted to schools that they otherwise would not be admitted to because you've lowered their scores. What happens is they don't compete, they drop out disproportionately, they're mad at the world, and they now have debt. So you haven't done anything. Mm. All you've done is made things worse. Another thing that happened uh, because of affirmative action was this last recession we had. It really was an affirmative action recession because through government policy, we pressured banks into, into changing lending standards. Yes. So anybody Disaster. who could fog up a mirror bought a house, including a lot of black and brown people who would have been better off renting. Recession comes, as recessions do. They lost everything. And from 2010 to 2013, black net worth fell 25%, yes. a steepest decline probably in the history of black America. 25% decline in three years because many people lost their homes that they wouldn't have had but for stupid government policy that encouraged them to buy a home when they shouldn't have had one in the first place. You know what? I, I knew what you just said on the surface. I've never heard it articulated. I, I hope that message gets out more. That's profound. I, I call it an affirmative action recession. And when people talk about wow. reparations, we paid reparations, a welfare statement of reparations, affirmative action reparations, oh changing all these lending standards because of the Community Reinvestment Act. That's a form of reparations. Set-asides. We can go all, we can play this game all night. And, and, you, and, you, and you want more? And furthermore, reparations properly, in my opinion, is the extraction of money from people who are never slave owners yeah. to be given to people who are never slaves. Yeah. You don't owe me anything, you didn't do it, and I was never a slave. For me to act like I was one is insulting to those who really were. In the black community, with what you just said, is that received because they're, they are working, they are raising a family, they're normal versus a politically pimped rhetoric that would take that? What, wh how, how is what you just said received among the good old average American black community? For a lot of blacks, they have never heard this message before. They've never heard That's what's exactly. happened because of the welfare state. They've never heard what, what's happened because of the affirmative action. They've never heard how many jobs have been destroyed because you jacked up the minimum wage. They've never heard the argument about wow. illegal immigration taking it away. When they've heard it, 
and had to listen to it, a whole lot of people are rethinking their assumptions. And that's why young people like Kanye West, young people like Candace Owens, young people like the Officer Tatum, carrying the message to people in their 20s and 30s and 40s the way I can't. I'm so happy about that. You guys, Larry Elder, heard nationally syndicated program, Salem Broadcasting Network, and, and I'm sure beyond online. Larry, can you look in the camera and tell people how they can connect with you, give all of the addresses, what they need to know? Well, you can see my film, Uncle Tom, by going to UncleTom.com. I'm very active on social media. I'm active on Instagram. I'm active on Twitter, at Larry Elder. I'm active on Facebook. I do, a, uh, I do two videos per week for Epic Times on YouTube. I also have another channel on YouTube called The Larry Elder Show Radio. So I am everywhere. You have no, you have no reason not to find me. Amen. Larry Elder, a national treasure. We love him. Thank Larry, you. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.